Thanks. And just to say, first of all, before being in Geneva, I spent 20 years in the field as a practitioner. And where we had the MPI um, presentation, I worked in all those countries for extended periods. So it's really nice to hear. In fact, it's music to my ears to hear all these presentations, but it's also slightly intimidating to be surrounded by all this scholarship um, and academia. But I think it's really what we need as a community in working in these places. Most of the context, uh, most of the data is humanitarian in nature, majority of it, but that seems to be changing slowly. And most of the programs are humanitarian too. But when displacement takes place, it has the physical, obvious human rights impacts on affected populations. But there's an awful lot happening under the surface. And reflecting on the presentations from Colombia, on Colombia and Burundi, you know, that tension reconciliation issue, there's a, there's a sort of, the ecosystem of society fundamentally changes. And I think the, the multi-country presentation from those five countries in East Africa, looking at the more developmental dimensions, particularly with the gender lens, and the same for Somalia, this is really um, the direction in which we need to go. If we're going to resolve things sustainably, we need to understand those very complex and nu nuanced impacts that are happening in displacement. How many people here are familiar with the high-level panel on internal displacement? Just put your hand up. Wow, it's less than I thought. So this group that met for two years to talk about displacement under the Secretary General, um, they just concluded. And they quickly went to, in the direction of focusing on durable solutions. Well, this concept of durable solutions is really hard to achieve. But if we are to achieve it, we need this sort of analysis from acad academic research to get there. So the high-level panel concluded in December of last year, of 2021. And since then, they produced what's called the Secretary General's Action Agenda. This is a 29, I think, point plan. But I want to draw attention to the first because it's directly linked to what these colleagues talked about. And in the first, he says, um, we need to ensure the search for solutions is driven by populations most impacted by crisis. We heard Severine in the first session say, everyone says that. Um, but specifically in the Secretary General's Action Agenda, he talks about community-based planning. So, I want to just say a few words about it because I think it's really important. And it has its roots in the, the community development practitioners in the 60s, Professor Chambers and all that group around him. Um, and it gained popularity under a World Bank project in the 80s, then sort of died off, and now it's come back. But what it didn't do is it, it was never used to address humanitarian crises, not to the extent required. And now the Secretary General's Action Agenda says, community-based planning is what you need to do. I'm telling you all this because it's directly linked to the data that was presented, that the community-based planning, uh, using these tools from the community development uh, era and, and community of practice, it unpacks those nuances, those ge gender disaggregated, differentiated dynamics in displacement settings, which is essential and a prerequisite for driving pathways towards long-term recovery. So I'm really pleased to see it as a sort of UN priority. Sorry to speak from the UN side of things. Um, and I hope that is one way to take academic research analysis, which is a critical baseline, and put it into practice going forwards. And we heard in the fireside chats before and in the first session, you know, that people solve their problems because they choose to solve them. So the first step for us is to find out, um, I'm speaking without notes, so it's a bit difficult to keep my thread. The, the first thing for us is to find out what that baseline is, but then the pe put the people in, the, in a position where they're able to define and drive their own solutions. And in, as such, the assessment process of community-based planning, the process becomes the product actually coming together as a peace-building process in and of itself. So I wanted to say all this because I think the presentations were really interesting, and I think for people like myself, it's really important to make that link between what the, the, the granular and nuanced understanding that's coming out of the academia and literature and link it with, with programs going forwards. And not those that are led by NGOs in the UN, but those that are led by local government authorities and the communities most impacted by, by displacement themselves. So that's what I could think of, listening to the speakers without preparing my PowerPoint, you know, yesterday. I hope that's... Uh, well, thank you very much, Sam. Um, I think those were excellent comments. You came in under time, so there's a lot to be said for speaking uh, <laughs> without notes or PowerPoints. Thank you very much. So let's um, have a round of applause for, for those. Okay.
Okay, so we have uh, 20 minutes or so left uh, now, so we're open to questions from the floor, or I think people are gathering questions online as well. So thank you. You have a microphone close to you, so you get to go first. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Grazia Bacilio from uh, CGR, Focus Climate Security. Thank, thank you very much for this fantastic presentation. So there's a lot of work that has been done there in understanding really the, the, the impact of, of the movement of people, of, of mobility on certain demographic groups and certain contexts, which is fantastic. But though, I would like to, to pick your brain on, on, on another aspect, which is aspect, which is essentially the, the, the reasons why people move in the first place. And I'm, I'm talking about mobility instead of forced displacement because of the don't negative, positive kind of uh, perspective of it all. Not all people move because they are displaced, but there is a voluntary migration that we should really consider. It's quite important. So uh, in understanding the reasons uh, for which the people migrate. We, we've looked a lot at the IOM data, the, the flow monitoring survey, etc. Uh, most of the times what we see is that, okay, there's been a conflict or for economic reasons. These are the two, or that there's a climate di disaster, but that's, that's likely less, less common in a way. Uh, and in fact, it's very difficult to understand, talking to people, a migrant, what are the real reasons uh, that, that are moving, uh, that are pushing them to, to move. Um, so how, what do you suggest we should do in order to, to really understand the real drivers of, of mobility? And how do you see um, this changing across different contexts and different uh, demographic groups? Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you very much. Let's take a couple now. We've got, let's go over to this side, side now. Thank you very much. I'm Eva Maria Egger from UNU Vider. Um, so I have also a bit the question of uh, what else can you tell us based on this very rich data and um, all your experience in the field. So for example, for Isabel, um, what do we know about the experience that the uh, displaced had when they were either internally displaced or abroad? So what, what of that experience is maybe driving the outcomes that you observe? And uh, Sophie, uh, do you know more about that, uh, about, yeah, also the existence of these camps in terms of the differences that you find? Are they driven by the, you know, challenging situation in the camps or is it something that these people bring with them because they had to leave everything behind and these kind of uh, background stories? Um, and then I have many more questions and comments, but I want to let others as well come to this. Thank you. Thank you. We've got one more next to you. Let's do three and then start there. So. Thank you. My name is Andres Villamizar. I'm from Colombia. I would like to ask Ana Maria uh, if there is any research being uh, conducted in the differences in the likelihood of a Venezuelan immigrant to be engaged in criminal activities with PEP and without PEP. Uh, now, I, I believe all Venezuelans are eligible for PEP, so it's going to become harder to uh, do this research, but I was wondering if you have any, any insights in that topic. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So let's um, stop there and get some answer, answers from our panelists. Is it possible to have any our virtual panelists, is it possible to have her on screen as well or not? Is it possible to have Eliana on screen? The, uh, who was the virtual, who presented her work virtually. Yes, here we are. Okay, I said that the first question was a general question, I think, to everybody, which was about understanding the causes of forced displacement. So perhaps um, we could do a quick, does anybody want to start with that? I think this, there are two questions, the two questions is one about, I think, measurement and questionnaires and what sort of questions we should have as researchers. I mean, that, 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 that's mm. an excellent question, mm. right? And, and a lot of the analysis that we do is on the basis of, of people having been displaced already. And, and, and in the context of forced migration, we take, we, we take the fact that they've moved being conflict. Uh, but, but you're right that there's many decisions and timings, right? And, and, and a lot of the analysis that we do, for example, in Burundi, there's always the question on when you leave why you live first, who lives first. And, and I think those, those, those nuances are, are 
should be part of the way we should be thinking in disentangling these reasons um, uh, or, or these drivers of, of, of moving and, and in the context of displacement. Um, any other insights? Yes. Uh, we will have a panel today to, the, to close the, the, the day about the Households in Conflict Network, and I'm going to discuss a little bit uh, all of that. But um, what I do believe that it's very important, besides knowing what drives uh, migration, and I agree completely with you that that is a decision, and that's an important decision, is that it's very difficult to separate many times economic conditions uh, from conflict dynamics, because sometimes the economic conditions are the result of conflict, and sometimes people are really migrating because they were victims, uh, were the victims of, of conflict. But what I think is very important in this discussion is that migration is a very important strategy and an alternative for people to survive amid conflict. For them to move, it's very important. Uh, equally so than for economic migration, where you migrate to seek better opportunities. Here, you're trying to seek protection and a refuge from from violence and conflict, so allowing people to migrate either internally or, ex or internationally is very important because you are providing people an opportunity to, to, to survive sometimes. Thank you. Sam, did you want to come in? Yeah, just to say I think the drivers of, yeah, drivers of displacement often obscures from view those complex array of decisions people make to displace themselves as a preventive measure for shocks and stressors. So the, the, the number of people who are actually forced to flee their homes in the night, terrible as it is, you know, is much smaller than that number that make that conscious decision. And I think whereas before displacement was often measured using humanitarian metrics, we're getting much better at looking at the social, economic, environmental and conflict dynamics that surround dis displacement. But also there's the enabling factors as well. So people who displace and move further afield, it's not just about the push and pull factors, but now these networks for migration are so set up across the Sahel, for example, that that's a, a massive consideration, as is digital communication, which is enabling those, those communication networks to set up, you know, people moving routes. I'm sure it's the same in the Northern Triangle. So I think we're getting better at finding out the data that we need to, um, to gather and also combine and anal analyze in a, in a more comprehensive way. I would make one just uh, short additional comment to say that as well as the reasons why people have been displaced, one particularly important area of study that I think is often underrepresented in questionnaires is asking more questions about what the actual process of displacement was like for people, the ways in which they left and what, how long it took them to flee or leave, because I think these are the sorts of things that we're having more and more research around trauma and the psychosocial effects that people have when they're in their new countries, that understanding what the actual process of displacement was like for individuals and what that relationship is to uh, the ways in which they're engaging in uh, the society in which they've resettled is also really important data to collect. Okay, so Eliana, would, do you have anything to add on this? Thank you, Lucia. No, just, just want to mention that it's, it's a very important point, at least uh, for the analysis of gender specifically in the case of Somalia. Um, many people uh, were displaced uh, not only because of natural disasters, but also because of conflict. So um, taking that into consideration in the analysis should also be something that we should be thinking of um, data permitting, right? Because it's not necessarily the same for a person to be displaced because of disasters versus conflict or combined, which is the case for the vast majority of, of displaced in Somalia, that they have been displaced multiple times because of both things. So something for, for us uh, researchers to, to think of in the future, and, and obviously, as mentioned in the panel, uh, taking that into consideration when collecting the data is also very important for future policy making. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so let's turn now to there was a specific question, I think, which was to Sophie on multidimensional on some of her findings. Oh, sorry, Isabel, did you have something to add? Uh, no. no, just uh, and you another, had a, a um, specific question. Yeah, to there you was a question well. about the um, yeah. about the experiences, and this is a great question. We we try to go at it in the paper uh, because obviously is these differences in experiences that may explain these attitudinal uh, differences and, and, and sentiments. And uh, one of the so so the the 
findings being driven by internal refugees, in, in, in a way we, we try to understand sort of what, what's behind this. And if you think about international refugees then coming back, they, they were in another place, but they also got a lot of assistance and there were international communities helping while they were away and while they were coming back, which was not necessarily the case for internal refugees. Uh, or states, for that matter. Uh, so, so um, we 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 do not necessarily explain whether these, how whether and how are these differences directly explaining our results, but 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 this is a I, I think this is sort of the key in here to to keep understanding and and to take into consideration in the design of policies, especially when sort of the return of lots of of, of um, displaced people needs to like needs to take this into consideration. Thanks. <clears throat> yes, and also I think just the kind of what else results. I mean, really, I think the key part of our study in looking at the MPI at the household, at the individual, and at the intra-household level was really showing us that the differences in poverty between households, so between hosts, between displaced peoples, was being driven by displacement status, but actually at the intra-household level for boys and girls in the same household, men and women in the same household, it was gender that was driving that diff difference rather than displacement. Um, and then the question really about camps, I think, yeah, so I think what we, like, I, like in the example of Ethiopia, while there were high levels of um, deprivations in the education indicators, so in people who had completed primary schooling, in children who were currently or not currently attending school, that while those were high among both hosts and the internally displaced populations, again, it was um, the gender differences were only significant amongst the refugee population. Um, so yeah, we did see that with camps, despite the fact that in Ethiopia there is a lot of um, foreign aid that goes into schooling for particular for camps. Um, um, so again, that, that difference between gender and displacement status and the different types of drivers that are made possible by the granular data, I think, is really interesting. And Eliana, is there anything to add? I, I think our findings are, to some extent, similar to um, what um, the panelist was uh, just saying, that some, many of the differences that we find are, are mainly gender differences are mainly um, among the displaced more so than, than, than on displaced. So um, this is probably related to specific uh, gender related disadvantages that, that people are, are facing in Somalia um, when displaced, right? Even though those that are outside uh, camps or, or even in these informal um, settlements also tend to face um, like specific circumstances that put them below the poverty line. I mean, poverty is, is very high in, in Somalia overall, but we do see that the gender difference tend to be, or disadvantages tend to be more marked among the, among the displaced. Well, thank Thanks. You. And so let's turn that uh, to Anna Maria. You had a specific question. Mm -hmm. Yes, Andres, I, that's really a great question. And, and we did a study, I didn't show it today because for the sake of time, but we tried to understand whether crime changes because of PIP and what we find, but we only have information on crime reports. We don't have information on crime participation, which we would love to get a hold of, but we haven't been able to get access to the data. But what we find very interestingly for gender issues is that there is an increase in crime reports for sexual violence and domestic violence from the Venezuelan migrants, from the women, who I believe feel that they are more integrated into society and they are less fearful to report crimes to the authorities and they, they are not feeling that they are, might be deported if they do it, uh, so they report more sexual violence and domestic violence. As victims. As victims, yes. Uh, and the, the, the effect is, is quite strong. But we want to know also about crime participation, but we don't have the information. We only have reports. Okay, thank you. So I think we have uh, a few minutes left, so time for another round of questions. I know there were some people I didn't get to, so we've got one. But we've got a lot. Can I ask you to keep your questions really short so that everybody gets to ask them? Let's start um, in the front here and then go, go backwards. So perhaps you could start first have a brief quick question about the representativeness of the data. For instance, Isabel, when you go 
to these communities and you uh, survey 15 households in each community. This is because they are the same size. I all, all the time worry, I like very much uh, Ana Maria's work that I know because I understand the type of survey that, that was done. I'd like you to comment on the, like, uh, uh, your, the specific question for you, but more generally on the use of uh, official household surveys in order to understand uh, migrant and refugees since they are not representative for them. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jesse Wood. I'm from the World Food Program, and thank you for these very interesting presentations. Um, first, a, a comment, and as a practitioner, I think it's very, very useful to see research like this come forward that gives us greater insight on the lived realities of displaced populations. Um, in particular, there's a preconception amongst many that refugees may be in a better situation than host uh, communities, given the, the humanitarian assistance, etc that goes to them, and I think your work is showing that that may not be the case, and we need to take that in consideration. Uh, the other point I wanted to raise was, I think there's a very good exploration of the impact or the um, outcomes associated with um, identity vis-a-vis -vis gender. But I don't, didn't see, and I, and I haven't heard, talk of other elements of marginalization, whether that's ethnic identity, social, caste level, um, or others, and, and that's a really big focus of our work right now, is we're, we're seeking to put, uh, the centrality of protection more, more forefront in our engagement with affected populations. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And there's somebody behind you as well. You can just press it. Thank you. Uh, Jean-François Mestat from UC Louvain. I have a question uh, to Anna Maria. Uh, what's the importance of this uh, two years uh, limit? Um, so what happened for refugees when you are at the end? And do you think that somehow you are, uh, we, it, it minimized the potential benefits of it because uh, refugees would have less incentive to invest in human capital. Uh, and then for Sophie, but it's a very small clarification, maybe we can talk afterwards. Um, when it, go, it went very fast, but I thought that one interesting contrast between the, uh, what I would call the incidence of poverty and the depth of poverty was for the incidence, the gap was huge between refugees and non-refugees, but not so much for the depth. So it suggests, do you think that aid may be an explanation for the fact that refugees would not go so, f so, so deep compared to some locals, for example, and maybe it may create some kind of tension? Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. We have another two more questions, I think, on this side. So if you get the microphone over there. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, uh, I have like um, three questions. I want to join former speakers on the reason of migration or as well as um, um, the issue. So I wanted to know in your sample, did you include those who migrate because of climate shocks, because forced displacement can also be due to climate shocks. And by the way, did you find any difference between urban and rural internally displaced persons? Uh, especially uh, for, um, let's say, climate shocks are more important sometimes in urban areas compared to rural ones. So uh, do you find, did you find that some groups are more vulnerable uh, to this uh, compared to others. And finally, I want to know, did you, for the refugee study, do you uh, find any difference between camp-based refugees and urban refugees? Thank you very much. Behind you for the last question. Yes. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Graham Blair. I'm from uh, UCLA. Um, at, at first question for, for Sophie. I was, I was really struck by the finding uh, from Northeast Nigeria um, where I've done some work that there was a 70% of people were monetarily poor, but not poor according to your multidimensional um, analysis. And so, as you pointed out, these are, these are measuring different things. And so I wonder whether you could just say something about um, what it means to be monetarily poor and, and, and not poor by the, by the MPI definition there. Like, is this, is this a, should I be thinking of this as um, people who are being provided basic services that, that are, that by external actors that are, that, that mean that they, they get all across the threshold in your measure, um, or, or, or is it, or, or is it something else? Um, and then for, for Ana Maria, I was really interested in the, the, 
uh, issue of, of xenophobia and the in, in take up of, of the state programs. Um, and so for, first I was curious if that was being directed at, at kind of all beneficiaries because you could be identified from this card um, that, that, you were, that you were Venezuelan. Um, and, and if not, I, I, I've read a little bit about the um, differences in the xenophobia directed at people who can be identified as Venezuelans easily um, by kind of ascriptive characteristics. Um, and, and people who, who maybe live closer to, to the Colombian border, um, and whether that kind of led to distributional differences in, um, in, in who benefited from it. Thank, thank you. Okay, so um, I think um, perhaps what I'll do is just go from, um, through the panelists in the order that you spoke, and you can pick up the um, questions that were either directly asked of you or your, or your research, or you can pick up the general questions. So let's start with Is Isabel. Sure. The... Um, thank you for the question on, on representativeness of the, of the survey. So this was a national representative sur survey. We used census data to sort of I, pick all the, all the households, all the sort of formal um, formalities uh, are, are in the paper. But in particular, we could have had households with no refugees or no, no migrants or no international migrants. So the idea was to be able to have sort of these comparisons. We had a, about, um, I think, um, let me see, remember, so it's so about 60% of the households, for example, were stays, uh, with about 20 something percent international returnees, and about 17% international returnees. Some households could have international returnees and international um, uh, internal returnees and international return, refugee, uh, returnees. Um, and so the other question was in terms of um, the, the other elements of marginalization. Um, uh, so uh, we, I mean, in, in, in the specific case of Burundi, we did not necessarily uh, ask about ethnicity. Uh, so this was um, sort of out of uh, the kind of questions we could ask, but we did have the proportion of, of different ethnicities, ethnicities at the community level. So in some of our previous work, we, we do account for that. But. Yeah, thank you. So <clears throat> quickly on household surveys, um, I would say that, yeah, so uh, most MPIs tend to use household surveys, so we, have a, we are very familiar with them. Um, one of the great parts of being a part of the research program that the World Bank did in the last couple of years is that we were using World Bank surveys that had recently been produced to sample for forced, uh, forcibly displaced populations. So I completely agree that to properly evaluate people's conditions using those surveys, it needs to be representative for those uh, population characteristics. So it just depends on the survey. Um, and But for our case, it was representative, and that's why we use them. Um, quickly on ethnicity. So actually, another fabulous feature of the MPI, I'd say, is that we are able to do disaggregations when they are representative mm -hmm. by ethnicity, by urban and rural area, by um, geographic and administrative region. And for at least some of the countries that we use, we did have ethnicity data. Um, but I think for, I mean, as you saw, we have so many, so much stuff to go through and we didn't end up doing that type of analysis on ethnicity, but I think it is important future research to absolutely do. Um, on the incidence and intensity question, so actually quite interestingly, it's a pretty common finding that there will be he big differences in incidence when you're looking at different comparable groups, but intensity tends to be not as varied, um, whether that's a feature of the measure itself or a feature of um, the conditions of the type of poverty that we study, I guess, is, is um, uh, there, there's work that my colleagues have done to kind of look into that that I can, uh, we could talk about later. Um, on climate, so I guess the, the camp versus urban, so we did find actually like that, and that's part of why I was highlighting the Ethiopia and Sudan case studies as we went through the five, is because the differences were definitely higher for the camp samples, whereas the other three countries, um, it wasn't necessarily that they were urban populations, but they were dispersed throughout the country. Um, and so uh, and so there were still differences by displacement status, but the poverty levels were higher for people living in camps. So I think that does absolutely make a difference. And then lastly, on the uh, Nigeria question around income poverty, so I, you're right, I don't think I said, because I was going quickly, um, the monetary poverty that we were using was the $1.90 a day 
uh, line. And actually, quite interestingly, Nigeria is one of the countries where uh, even in our global index, which we compute with the Human Development Report Office at the UN every year, Nigeria, excuse me, is one of the countries that often has the greatest mismatches with multidimensional poverty and monetary poverty. Um, and I'm sure there's lots to say about that. But um, part of, yeah, I mean, the, the main gist of it is that income poverty, I think, um, and multidimensional poverty, sometimes you're seeing big overlap in the populations about the types of people that we're talking about. But in a few cases, and actually in Nigeria in particular, the difference is often enormous. So they are measuring different but complementary things. Thank you. Eliana, over to you. Thank you, Lucia. And yeah, so the survey that we use for Somalia, the high frequency survey, it's a representative of internalized based populations. Um, so we were able to, to do it because of that. Um, however, that's that's not the case in, in many uh, national household surveys, even when um, when the population that has been displaced uh, is, is tends to be large. Uh, in the case of ethnicity, um, in our case, it was difficult because we were already dealing with relatively small groups for the household family type or family types. So going beyond that uh, would be quite hard with the data uh, and it might not be uh, useful to do inference at that level. Um, but I also agree that it's very important to, to take ethnicity into consideration in a study that we did also with Lucia, Lu, Lu, um, Uche, Ekator, and Diana Arango on, on the impacts of Boko Haram on uh, gender-based violence in Nigeria. We do take into consideration ethnicity and it makes a difference in, in the likelihood of experiencing either um, intimate partner violence or controlling behaviors. And in terms of the, the question now of climate shocks, uh, yes, so I, I, I think I mentioned that uh, we do include people displaced by climate-related shocks and uh, conflict. And, and I agree that it might be useful to conduct analysis separately, maybe um, in a future stage, because I mean, these might have different implications, not only from a gender perspective, but also in terms of the risk of experiencing poverty and responding to that. Thank you. Thank you, Eliana. Anna Marie. Thank you very much. Uh, first, a, a little word, uh, some ideas on the elements of marginalization and migration and ethnicity. Uh, we're doing a, a project with, with Marcela uh, here about um, attitudes towards migrants. And basically what we're doing is that we're doing an intervention to improve the attitudes towards migrants. And in the Dominican Republic, we do a video with uh, Venezuelan migrants that are sim more similar to the population in Republican, Dominican Republic and Haiti. And what we find is that people are much more responsive and much more positive to the video of uh, the Venezuelan migrant and not the, the one from Haiti. So there are a lot of linkages and, and a lot of overlaps between uh, migration, but also with ethnicity and some other, um, some other dimensions. About the two-year limit, that's very important, but we were not able to to analyze that because they, if the two-year limit ended, they could um, apply for another one. That was quite easy, but we were not able to do it because the government launched another one that was much wider for 1.8 million Venezuelans, and it was for a two-year, ten-year uh, process. But we did, in some surveys that we just ended, ask something about uh, the the incentives to invest, giving that the time span increased, but I'm not sure we can, we are going to be able to do something very good with that. On climate migration, I think that's a very important question and it's very important on terms of survey design, how do we ask that? Because maybe they don't want to say to you that they migrated because of climate, they might say that if they migrated because the, the their income dropped or that their yields, the, their agricultural production was destroyed or something like that, but it was ultimately because of climate migration. And you find that, for example, in El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras, when they do that question to people from the Northern Triangle, from the a dry corridor, they say that they migrated be because they were, because of hunger, but it was because the, the crop failure and, and which was related to climate migration. And Graham's question about Venezuela, yes, we, we really need to, to look much more into that. Of course, they have this card, and this card shows that they are Venezuelan. They don't have 
yet the Colombian ID because they are not Colombians. They, are, they have a status, a special status, but they cannot be. But there is really a lot of um, a xenophobia because of that, and it has increased over the years. At the beginning, it was not. But we haven't studied that, and perhaps you give us a good idea to show different results for Barranquilla, where the migrants are very similar to the Venezuelans. They have the same language, very similar culture, and Bogota. And in focus groups, they really said that being in Bogota was extremely painful, that they had a lot of obstacles, whereas in Barranquilla, it was, it was much better. So we need to explore that, and I think that's a very good question. Okay. Finally, Sam. That could be really quick because it's lunchtime for everyone. I know I won't make any friends if I do, but from the World Food Programme's uh, question, we all need a level of categorization when we do assessments just to organize our questionnaires and assessments. But we've also found, and I know WFP have as well, that forming, uh, enabling communities to self-identify with the socioeconomic groups that they identify themselves with can be much more powerful and empowering during peace building and resilience processes. So whereas the baseline is there, we've tried to incorporate those best practices I could talk about that for hours, but I won't. Um, and then on climatic shocks, of course, some people are much more vulnerable, the coastal areas of Mozambique, the Shabele valleys of Somalia, to, you know, to rapid onset shocks. But I think the group that's of most concern to us, and we're certainly engaging with governments to try and respond to that, is the pastoralists across the Sahel region, you know, from the Somali region of Ethiopia all the way to, all the way to Senegal. And I think looking forwards, we're going to have to get much smarter about how we respond to the, their, their needs, their adaptation needs, as the climate changes so quickly. OK, thank you, Sam. And um, thank you, everybody, for staying with us into your lunch hour. Congratulations to all our panelists um, for fantastic papers and a really stimulating discussion. So please give, join me in a final round of applause. <laughs>